Hello, and welcome to the Hope Relentless Marriage Podcast. Chad and Sarah Gale here, and well done on investing in your relationship. It never gets old. This is why we say every podcast, you are resourcing your marriage, and so you are making a difference in this world. You are a world changer because marriages impact families, families impact communities, and communities impact the world. So well done. That's right, world changers. It is great to be with you here today uh, whenever you're listening to this. Today, we're going to continue the conversation we started last week. We started to answer the question, what to do when you feel like you're doing it all? And so in part one, last week's podcast, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that, feel free to check that out. We talked about this challenge, this dilemma that couples face in different seasons of life. And that's when, what do you do when you feel like you're carrying more than your share, in air quotes? of the responsibilities or the weight, the burden. And so some of the key takeaways in that podcast was talking about the importance of being on a team. Uh, It's important within marriage, we are teammates overcoming the obstacles and challenges together, not opponents competing against one another. Contribution. When we focus on what we are contributing to the relationship, rather than falling into the trap of a transactional relationship where we're keeping records of right and wrong, we talk about why that becomes problematic in a relationship. And today we want to continue that conversation and and looking at, okay, you still have this frustration or we still have this complaint. How do we communicate effectively? There can be times where we're overwhelmed. There can be times where we need help. There can be times where reaching out to your spouse, your teammate, your partner is exactly what we should do and work on the solution or the challenge together. And so today we want to talk about the communication that helps couples work together when one person is feeling like they are doing it all. All right. Yes, this is so relevant because I think if you've been married for just longer than a couple days, you run into these conversations and these feelings where it's like, hey, if I do this, shouldn't he or she be doing that? And then you're you're just wanting to navigate it. And it might not be malicious initially, but it is important to have these conversations as far as, hey, what are we thinking when it comes to this area? And so I think a lot of times this area is fueled by emotion because it's, it's us seeing something that maybe isn't done that we think should be done because we did something. So therefore something should be done. Um, and so then we're emotional and we, we kind of want to just go and have communication with our spouse in a way that is fueled by emotion. And so what I like to tell couples is to breathe, to take the time to slow down and to think about what it is that you're wanting to say. And we're going to take you guys through a couple of different areas that you can consider before you just start talking. I think there's this misconception in communication that if I feel it and if I think it, I need to say it right now. And we've talked about this in a different podcast where the timing is important. If it's not a good time to bring something up, don't bring it up just because you feel like it. Because we have to strategic or strategically have an idea of what did we discuss with our spouse is a good time to talk about things that matter that we can both give attention to. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point that the reality is not all communication is equal. And so how we communicate is really important. And oftentimes, even when counseling couples, the faster and more urgent the communication, the more often it kind of goes sideways and Mm -hmm. becomes destructive. Mm -hmm. I know in our own communication, when um, I start talking louder or when I start feeling the sudden need to interrupt or cut you off or talk over the top of you, it's like whatever I feel I need to say is so important, I stop some of these healthy patterns. Um, that's a sign that we're we're not be, we're not communicating effectively. And so right. I think when we go to share this frustration or complaint that we either feel overwhelmed or like we're doing more than our share, oftentimes slower, more intentional communication is more effective. And so there's a couple things that Sarah Gale and I want to look at. Um, we call whether you want to think of these as communication tools 
The first tool is understanding expectations and how to move them towards mutual agreements. Another idea within that is what assertive communication and active listening looks like. So first, I want to outline this idea of moving expectations into mutual agreements. And so Sarah Gale and I talk about with couples kind of three steps. And really, you could think of it as four steps. The first one is the awareness that we're frustrated. This is that initial thought when we feel like we are doing more than our share or when we're feeling overwhelmed, that's kind of an alarm or a siren that we want something different and that's okay. It's, it's learning how to communicate that effectively. So the first part of an expectation is to communicate. The second part is to seek agreement. And the third part is to discuss the details. And that third part is often where we miss each other. And this might be why we're feeling like we're doing more than our air quote share to begin with. It could be just the details that we feel like we're both operating our, in our lanes, but we misunderstand one another. But before we dive too deep into that, I actually want to go back up to step one. And that is this idea of communication. How we communicate with our spouse is important. So babe, can you share a little bit around assertive communication and what that looks like and why it's so important. Yeah, I, I do think that the expectation sets the stage here because we have to be aware of what it is that we're even wanting before we communicate assertively. Because assertive communication means, hey, I know what I want and I'm communicating it in a way that I'm taking ownership. I'm speaking in an I statement and I'm able to express in a way that that still is, of course, respectful, but that is clear as to, hey, my desire is whatever, right? Like my desire is that we go on more dates, for example. And so typically there's an, a situation that is happening that it's like, hey, in this scenario, um, this is what I'm feeling. And then there's an explanation and a request. And so the assertive, the assertive communication is very powerful because it takes us from kind of victimhood as far as, oh, you know, he or she's not doing this or um, nobody helps me with anything. And it puts us in a place where we can use our words to express clearly what we're wanting to see in that area. And I think that phrase, what we're wanting is important. Oftentimes, and I don't know if you run into this, but when working with couples and there and there's an area of frustration or what I kind of term a complaint, uh, couples get stuck on what they don't want and turning the corner and transitioning that into what they do want seems to be a hurdle. But once mm -hmm. they can turn that corner, it opens up new communication. I think one of the examples we were looking at loosely last week in this feeling overwhelmed or like we're doing more than our share was the evening routine. For a lot of couples, the evening routine is challenging. It's the end of the day. So one or both people might be tired. Depending if you have kids, there's homework, there's bedtime routines, there's dinner, there's cleaning up for dinner, let alone any time to yourself or to actually connect. And so depending, we can enter that dynamic every evening with different expectations. And oftentimes we're aware of what we don't want. I know, you know, for us, something we don't want is to wake up in the morning and have the kitchen look like a bomb went off and the dinner and the dishes are everywhere. That's what we don't want. Mm -hmm. And so part of assertive communication is recognizing many times what we don't want is what we recognize first. And so then it's trying to convert that into what we do want and holding on to that teammate perspective and sharing in the I statements. And so that's an important part. It's that taking ownership. And I kind of talk about it as giving our spouse a clear target. When I share with you what I want or when you share with me what you want, it's like giving me a target that I can go and I can hit and I can accomplish with clarity and a better understanding of what actually moves us forward as a team. Anything else for you, babe, around assertive communication and what you have found 
helpful either in our relationship or when working with couples? Yeah, I just think that assertive communication can be easier said than done. You know, it, it, it seems a bit simple. Just say what you mean, you know, or say what you mean, mean what you say, and just make it clear. And I think there are some, some things that can limit us. And so I just want to go through a couple of those, those things that just kind of came to mind. And one of them is that we haven't quite created a safe space in our relationship to have these kind of conversations. And so it's almost as if we feel like if we say what we want or what we would like to see, then we, we feel like we're going to be criticized or we're, going to, it, we're not going to be accepted. And that's just not something that we do in our relationship. And so that safe space, and we're going to talk about that in a moment um, with some Go John Gottman research, but I think that could be a reason. There hasn't been a safe space. And then another reason could be that we don't even, we don't even know what we want. And I alluded to this earlier where it's that, that lack of self-reflection. In this day and age, we don't spend enough time with ourselves to even recognize why we're having a hard time. And a typical one for a mom, for example, could be like, you know, I need, I need to do pickup. I need to go to the grocery store. I cook the dinner. I arrange the meals and all this stuff. And then you find yourself being frustrated and your husband comes home and you're frustrated with him, even though he's been at work. This is stereotype for sure, you know, in this dynamic. Yeah. Um, but because if I don't stop as a mom and just recognize, hey, what are all the things that I have up in the air and what is causing me to feel depleted and almost what is, what is the breaking point for me? Cause usually we have a breaking point and then that's when we go off of emotion and we say some mean things and, uh, that's, that's when it, that's when it goes south. And so before it gets there, it's recognizing, okay, these are all the things I, I have on my plate. This is what I want in the midst of all of these things and just in communicating that way. But that self-reflection is, is very important. And then I think the last thing is knowing that what you feel, what you want matters, because I think sometimes we just will like shy back a little bit. We'll, or we'll pull back and we'll say, we're not worth it. And some mm. of this goes into self-esteem. Some of this goes into how we were, we were raised. We didn't have a voice. And so, gosh, assertiveness is a, is a bad word for us. We don't want to be too much. And so I think we have to deal with some of those, the, the areas that can prevent us from being assertive so that we actually can be assertive. Yeah, I think that's, that's really good on the self-awareness. I think one of the things for me that helps me recognize that I am not being assertive is when I think you should already know, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a common thing within mm -hmm. couples is mm -hmm. we've been together for X years. They should know. Yep. And that really is a sign that assertiveness is needed in those moments. It's somebody communicating, I guess, first identifying what they want and then sharing that. I think another powerful question for couples is, to ask each other, anything I can support you with today, mm -hmm. anything I can help you help with tonight. And, you know, you, you brought up a really important point, And that is sometimes we don't have that environment in our relationship or in our marriage where assertiveness is welcome. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about marriage and communication is both people can make significant progress by taking ownership. So one person can take ownership. I'm going to be more assertive, but the other spouse can also take ownership and say, I'm going to be proactive in reaching out and serving and caring for my spouse in a way where I create the environment for them to feel safe, for them to feel heard, for them to be assertive. And the power is when we both take ownership of our role then we're able to close whatever that gap is between the two of us much faster than we often thought possible. But it doesn't focus. It's, the solution isn't pointing fingers, right? The solution is ownership and kind of back to what we talked about last week. And that is the idea of contribution. Each person focused on contributing to the relationship in meaningful ways. Anything else with assertiveness before we maybe talk about active listening? No, that's, well, I guess I, I think I'll mention here, actually, John Gottman, because sometimes when we're assertive, we might find ourselves in these areas that John Gottman talks about sometimes. So I just want to uh, mention that now. Okay. So 
John Gottman has some research when it comes to communication, and he says there are four things that you want to stay away from because these four things are found in couples that divorce. Um, and it, I mean, they're found in all couples really, but when it comes to the ones that are divorced, they're definitely found in, in a greater, in a greater, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Chad, in a greater amount. That's not the word I'm yeah. looking for. Volume, but yeah. quantity, something, I don't know. Quantity in a greater quantity. That's still not, but yeah, you know what I'm saying? So the first one is criticism and criticism speaks to character. And it's something like, you know, you always do this. You never do that. And so it's not taking the, the moment that we're in, rather it's saying, this is who you are. This is what you do. And so that's how we can identify are we criticizing the other person? Assertiveness is not criticizing. Assert yeah. Assertiveness is I feel like I statement, I want, right? It's it's that ownership. It's not a it's not a critique on your spouse to be assertive. So I think that's important to to recognize. And the the opposite of criticism or how we combat this in our marriage is we have these soft startups. So like we talked about at the beginning of this podcast, communication doesn't need to just be quick what i feel and just say what you, what's on your on the top of your mind right it's yeah. this ease into it and i think some couples are like oh i don't want to walk on eggshells well you know it's all about perspective <laughs> it's, it's it's hey do you want to have a conversation that can be better received or do you just want to be right you know cuz yeah. you could be right and you could be destroying your marriage so we want a soft start up because it, it's a way that we show respect for that person we're talking to in a way that it's just easier for anyone to respond because we, when we respond, we don't know where the other person is. We don't know what they're thinking about in that moment. We don't know what they've been through in the day. So when we start a conversation, that startup is very important. Can you, can you maybe provide a little bit more details or practical steps of what is a soft startup? Like, what does that sound or look like if somebody had a complaint? Um, let's maybe use the example that somebody is overwhelmed with the evening responsibilities and is mm -hmm. looking for help. What would a soft startup look like? Yeah, gosh, I'm totally overthinking this, I think, because I'm thinking of, hey, well, let's make sure it's a good time to even bring up the conversation. And we've talked about that in the past. Like if we're really going through, okay, what would this look like? We need to recognize, is this a good time to have the conversation, number one? So it's like a check-in. And I think we could maybe even include that in the soft startup. It's just like, hey, can I talk to you about something? And then it's using those I statements. It's if you want to say, you know, I feel overwhelmed when I'm doing this, 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 can we talk about that and see if we can come up with a solution together? It's, yeah. it's not about accusing its ownership. And I think when we, especially when we state our feelings in that way, I think that it, it creates a softening because I think we're more likely to identify, Oh, like they are feeling that way. They're not blaming me for making them feel that way, but because I love this person, wow, they're feeling sad. They're feeling overwhelmed. Like, gosh, I, I want to do what I can to, to help. Yeah, I, I think you kind of did a good job breaking that down in the power of the I statements versus the you statements. Not always true, but more often, if we're using you statements, we're likely stepping into that first horseman that, that the Gottmans talk about of criticism. But when we stay in the I felt, um, I would like to talk about that staying in that assertive communication, which is really important because oftentimes one of the other horsemen that the Gottman Institute, Institute talks about is defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And what we see over and over again in negative communication patterns for couples is criticism feeds defensiveness. And then yep. the conversation goes sideways so quickly. And so assertive, I'm not assertive, active listening is kind of an alternative to defensiveness. So mm -hmm. if defensiveness is often seen by shifting the blame, making excuses, um, this was a big one for me. I used to share my intentions with you a lot. And my mm -hmm. thought was, well, if she understood my intentions, she wouldn't be hurt. But really, I was being defensive instead of active listening, of asking 
follow-up questions and wanting to understand, in the example that you gave, what can you share with me more what it means for you to be overwhelmed and maybe asking questions. Can we look at, are there particular parts of the evening where you're feeling more overwhelmed than others, right? It's keeping that first person that brought up the complaint or the, the assertive communication as the subject and as a team working towards a resolution. And so the power of assertive communication and active listening is they are the exact opposites of criticism and defensiveness. Yeah. And it creates this environment where it's easier for both couples to feel heard, to understand how to contribute and encourage, and really work towards resolution on the day-to-day -day challenges as teammates. Anything else for you around the active listening or defensiveness that comes to mind? It's just a game changer. Like even as you're describing that environment that we have the opportunity to create, it's it's so refreshing to be able to state something that you know you're you're overwhelmed with and have your spouse not take defense because and part of it's how you word it, but rather want to help and see how you can work together as that team. It's so refre refreshing. So I hope we can really get this. Yeah. And I think sometimes for couples, what I encourage them is this is a skill that takes time. I mean, mm -hmm. I think some of us, depending on our career or industry, we have mastered skills, but over years or decades. And so in communication with our spouse, some of these things are skills. And if we mm -hmm. practice them and we apply them and we are curious in learning what are common traits of healthy couples and how do they communicate? We might not fix it overnight or in one podcast or in one counseling session, but we'll be making progress towards growth in these areas. And it really does change the day-to-day -day environment or tone. Same person, same marriage, drastically different experience and environment. And that really is what we get excited about helping couples kind of turn that corner and taking conflict from being destructive, hurtful, or toxic and actually leveraging conflict to build connection, to create vision and clarity and reinforce that togetherness, that common bond of living and enjoying life, which includes facing and overcoming obstacles and challenges, but together. All right. So Chad, I'm wondering if I should talk about the rest of the horsemen or we should just have people do the research because Really, those two were the ones that pertain to what we're talking about the most, the defensiveness and the criticism. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll probably talk about those other ones in a different podcast. But yeah, I mean, I think part of part of what helps people grow is when we take ownership and we're, we're curious and we want to learn and find new ways of interacting. And so if people want to learn more about the other horsemen, the Gottman Institute has a ton of incredible resources uh, just around bigger things. And so I would encourage them go check that out, learn more about some of these communication patterns and habits. All right. Well, let's transition as we are closing to appreciation time. I feel like we forgot this the last podcast. I was nope. up late we did like, it. into the late hours thinking about it. We did it? We did it. We did oh, it. Oh, okay. Well, let's do it now. And so um, appreciation time, appreciation time. Again, we're doing this because we want you listening to also do it and get into a habit of appreciating one another. It just changes the atmosphere. And so Chad, one thing I appreciate about you is your organization. Sometimes I resist against it uh, because I'm a, a little bit all over the place sometimes, but I really value it because we get things done and you keep us on track. So I appreciate that about you. Thank you, babe. One of the things I appreciate about you is kind of the opposite of that, and it's you are more spontaneous. Um, I think this is a classic example where we can learn to celebrate and appreciate the opposites. And so your spontaneity, 
um, and just kind of, hey, let's go do something keeps life fun and enjoyable and allows us to enjoy experiences that maybe my organized self would have dismissed. I think recently you were going to attend a concert with a friend and your friend was sick and you invited me to fill in the gap. And so we had a spontaneous date night that we enjoyed. We also felt old at the end when the band that we wanted to see still hadn't started. But the At point 10.30? Is, Who does that? 10.30. But the point is, I appreciate your spontaneity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, you listening, I know that when it comes to feeling like doing it all, it can feel very frustrated or frustrating. It can feel very frustrating. And so I just want to encourage you and hopefully you grabbed hold of something that helped and continues to help and have the conversation together with your spouse. And I want to encourage you to know that there is always, always hope.